Hello, and welcome to our next expedition to the XR Knowledge Metaverse podcast with John Green and Rena Wolzinger. Rena, I do that to you every time. I don't mean it. <laughs> and I'm Jamie Justice. And uh, I want to welcome you today to a kind of a, another informal discussion that we've been having here on these podcasts as we think about how we get to this knowledge metaverse that we hear so much about. Uh, last week, we talked about uh, where we are today, essentially, and what we think we'll see happen within the next 10 years and how things are going to change with XR, augmented reality, virtual reality, and, and all the tools that we're, we're seeing used around that environment. And we had the thought before we started talking today about uh, what it was like when we first were exposed to an XR experience, whether it was VR or AR or, or some one of those other, what I like to call random acts of progress prior to 2021, where people used virtual reality or augmented reality in, in a unique and different way to either improve education or training or just entertainment for that matter. And so I thought since last week we went to the future, this week we may go back and, and see how far we have leapfrogged from the time that we were first engaged with uh, augmented and virtual reality in some capacity. And so to that end, I'm going to let John and Rena begin uh, with, with kind of sharing their experiences, and then I'll, I'll share my long and storied history at the end of that, and then we'll see where all this comes together. And then in the coming uh, podcast, we're, we want to start looking more closely at some of the feature sets of the XR, Eon XR platform, such as spatial meetings, merged XR, how we use digital twins, the XR platform itself, and some other future trends that are beginning to happen within our environment that are really exciting. And, and one day we're going to turn Rena loose to tell you all about the avatars and the exciting new things that we're going to be able to add in, in a coming release. But for today, we're going to go backwards just a little bit and then spring back into the future. So the first question, uh, I guess I can throw out here open to either John or Rena, and you can see who hits the button first to take over, uh, is what was your first experience with augmented or virtual reality in how to improve the teaching and learning process or, or, or just any first experience you want to talk about, about what you could do at the time you were first exposed to virtual reality or augmented reality. So I'll turn it over to you guys and let you kick it off. Well, I'll jump in here, uh, Jamie, and, and uh, my experiences, you know, I, I come from an uh, online education background. I uh, exposed to a lot of language learning platforms, uh, people learning online. And when I came across the XR experience, I remember clearly putting a model of a human lung, the bronchioles, in AR mode right there on my counter when I first started creating experiences. And I was just amazed at how visually appealing it was, how visually stimulating it was. Just uh, I was looking at the model and all. These things. And from previous my background is when uh, of experience in online learning is where there's a preset curriculum. You follow the guided path, you follow the modules, you complete it, you check it off, repeat the same process. But with XR experiences, there's so many possibilities. There's the model. And now I can put myself in the creation seat. And it took me a while to realize that, but the more and more I've worked with XR experiences, I realized that you are almost flipping the script. You are learning by creating, you are learning by doing. And there's a world of possibilities. And I'm seeing it now as new applications are being released to, uh, from so many different areas about digital twins, as you mentioned, XR learning. Uh, but going back, it, it really changed the, my point of view where uh, I thought there's a the role of the students to learn and follow the, the guided path, per se. Mm -hmm. but with XR, it just puts so many, many more tools and it empowers the learner to become a creator of content. And the learning that takes place in that process of creation is really amazing. Um, we begin to ask questions, we've been to, to learn in unique ways uh, and almost become become artists in, in the way we, we learn each one. We are individuals, we are learning different styles, we think differently, and I think XR really adapts to people's individuality uh, and personalities and learning styles. So that's what uh, really has become clear to me uh, through XR experiences. So Rena, your thoughts? Hi, everybody. So this goes way back. Um, I was trying to think about it. I really started in the days of uh, 2D and Pong and like asteroids, <laughs> missile command. So I'm going way back to my 2D history and, and learned how to do 2D design and early CAD programs to 3D. But what really changed is when 
I started to see games, I want to say, say like Halo, but it was probably before that when I really didn't even understand how to move my screen around in 3D. Uh, when I was first doing it, because I spent so much time in 2D, I knew how to make like kind of 3D renderings, but not kind of 3D in motion. And then um, as a filmmaker, then it started to become like, how do you get 3D moving assets into a film and, and render those and, and do compositing? And then it came to, oh, wow, I can do it on my own computer and I can design things in 3D software and move them around on my screen or on my phone with my mouse or just my fingers. And, you know, then it came to goggles. And so it's been a full, like, that's like 30 years of information right there in 15 seconds. But uh, so, in, you know, in learning and, and teaching, uh, I've been, you know, most of my career teaching, I'd say in 2D, just showing things um, in videos or showing, you know, using a whiteboard, uh, lately doing things on Zoom. But, uh, and so my students would basically watch me lecture and listen and then now I can say, okay, jump into this model and interact with it, take it apart, do things. It's a completely different thing. And what I love about it is with that modality, you can't just kind of turn off and do nothing. You know, you're doing things. And I think mm -hmm. what I've experienced the most in these years is of teaching is when students are actually doing things and engaged and um, working on projects is when all the learning happens. And so, you know, I have them um, go into models, take them apart, put them together, label things, do research, and then stay. I think the what I love about it is you can stay in that 3D environment. So, you know, you can add content in there instead of leaving, leaving that environment, going back into 2D. So I think the more, what I'm excited about is the more uh, the internet, you know, is now fast and our graphic cards are fast, our phones are fast. So the more we can do in, staying in that environment, the better. Um, and that, um, I think that's really changing learning fast, you know, um, and just going back again to the beginning, it, you know, none of this was possible on the computer. I think uh, we were using computers just to kind of look at assignments and things, but not interacting. And, and which is interesting because students have been interacting on their phone at home, uh, you know, doing games and doing like, things like even Minecraft, things like that, and then hopping. And then we had this idea that you needed to put your technology away and then go back and learn on the whiteboard. And I think we're finally changing over to, oh, we can use technology in the classroom and uh, and then utilize those same tools as learning tools. And I really think that's been a long process to come to that conclusion now. With, um, and I think students uh, learn better that way because that's the way that they're born with phones in their hands. So it's really changed things a lot. Right. Well, uh, just to the same same end, I think for me, it all started in a little log cabin in Southern West Virginia about 60 years ago, <laughs> 61 years ago tomorrow. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, I was going to go back. I, I've always targeted my start date with virtual reality is March 5th, 2002. And there were a lot of things around that date and why I use that. but. Rena, you, you triggered uh, something in my mind way back into my early teaching days, the first year uh, in 1990 in high school program. We uh, I did a modular-based technology education program as first faculty at Dunbar High School here in Lexington, Kentucky. And we had a, a CAD software, a software is called Autodesk Animator, which was basically a 2D type tool, but you could animate characters and draw things with it and, and put some animation to it. And I, I think probably that was the real forerunner of my interest in, in this area and how it could be used in education. And then spring forward to my time in the Kentucky Community and Technical College system. Uh, we were early on around that time period of March, I was, I was taken to an American Association of Community Colleges conference in Long Beach, California. And one of the things that we were starting at that time as an initiative was using stereoscopic video, where we had two cameras with eye mount you know, separation uh, the spacing and so forth, and that as I would walk towards the camera, I would appear out of the screen in the in the audience to, to people, and they were wearing their, their stereoscopic glasses and had a lot of wow factor. Uh, but it just it didn't lend itself to really easily being able to build and share content and what was the real value of it. Then from that point. We tried several things, creating what we were calling at the time emergence learning and, and the College Collaborative Network, in that we had a tool with, with a, a partner that has long since gone away 
that was somewhat of a, a 3D object oriented presentation. You could take a model of a, of a vice or some simple tool and present it in a stereoscopic presentation, which always required the silver screen and glasses and so forth, with the intent of faculty building all these lessons around that content. And then we spring forward to a lot of things that happened with me beyond that when we started using the Eon suite of tools that we were able to build interactive types of, of applications that were simulations, like how to give an insulin injection, choose the right vial, choose the right syringe, and put that in an avatar leg. And, but the problem with all of those things, and there are many others, and I like to call those random acts of progress, was that there was difficulty sharing it, it was inconsistent on computer power for who your end users would be. It many times required high-end equipment or some type of arena type of learning experience to engage everyone, almost like a movie theater kind of thing. And then, but it still, it was engaging. It was exciting. I was drawn into it and I saw the potential for what it could do. But I see the enthusiasm in, in YouTube and what you see now and what you've had from experiences. And I see the same thing for myself here going forward in 2021 and 2022, that finally all those things we dreamed of, we can now do easily, you know? And and everyone has this, this type of device, whether it's, you know, a tablet, if you can see it from my background, or your cell phone, uh, that allows you to be connected in a unique and different way using digital technology. And the fact that we can put this in the hands of students and they can have so many experiences. And John, to build on your comments, I mean, just there's like this plethora of, of opportunities and access that you can have using the tools that are provided here in our platform, whether it's a spatial meeting where we meet as avatars, which Rena will share more with you about in the future, where we can interact with around objects and in environments. And we can take something that's just an object and now it's this big, massive learning tool with access to the World Wide Web and images and videos and things that, that you, the faculty create or students create. You know, it's all open and it's a great resource to, to change the way that we learn and the way we share content going forward. And so it's been a quantum leap. You know, if I go from Autodesk Animator to, to what I see that we're able to do today and all the other range of experiences I had over the last 20 years now, it's just amazing to where we are today. And to me, we're at the starting point now of no longer random acts of progress, but strategic applications of XR, augmented virtual reality, mixed reality, to change the way people teach and learn and experience their learning in their own unique way. So that's kind of my 10 cents throwing on top of everything else and going back through my long history. Uh, but you know, where do you, where do you think this all comes together? Do you, do you all see it the same way that I do as far as this convergence? of capability changing from what we knew originally. This is not your, your mom and dad's XR, it's now <laughs> your children's grandchildren's XR. What, what do y'all think about that? Any other, other thoughts you'd like to share on the process? Well, just some thoughts on what you said just triggered an idea when you talked about sharing, the ability to share content between students, teachers. Uh, and I've seen it just back up a bit, a real trend in, in just the social media and how we've become very comfortable sharing videos whether it's a TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, um, our culture is going this way where we're, we can make quick videos, we can share them. And what I'm seeing is that education, it, it needs to get on the same path. And the, these are abilities that, that uh, students have, uh, these amazing abilities to capture content, edit videos and share. Well, with XR experiences, I'm seeing th those same skill sets uh, being applicable to learning. If I can, maybe I'm looking at the human cell and I can make a quick video of me talking about the different parts. I can upload a model, put in AR mode. I can walk around and walk through the cell while making a video and I'm talking about it and I can create a QR code maybe and share that to my students and share it to my colleagues. And within the, and just thinking where we were, where we create an assignment, I upload and maybe an email, I send the email to my, 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 my teacher. But now I can use all these skills that, that we see where society is headed to in, in terms of creating content uh, in video-based format. Well, we can incorporate that into the learning uh, paradigm and, and use those skills in terms of creating content and sharing that. And through some experiences we have here with Eon, where I can screen record, screen capture, create my video, upload, and and share that so i, I kind of see that those trends where it's it's been where it's headed where it's now and kind of where it might be going 
going forward. So I think that that's a exciting point you brought up and just uh, reminded me how, how that has changed a lot during the um, looking backwards and then where we're headed going forward is the ability to share content. And Jamie, you reminded me of uh, another thing when you mentioned about like an auditorium type of thing. I did a project years ago with the Long Beach Aquarium here in California and it, we developed a broadcast, broadcast studio so students around the world can see experience animals and even even uh, university students were learning about advanced uh, fluid mechanics with all of the water flow in the, in the aquarium. But what we did is we had teachers on video explaining things and then we pre-prepared videos for them to show about all of the different sea life or, or whatever we were teaching mm -hmm. about. But now that's a com and that's the past, right? But now you could do that. You could uh, send students uh, th 3D immersive lessons about let's just give an example of dolphins or something, dolphins, penguins, they could be learning about it and interacting with those beautiful animals um, instead of just watching a video. And that even goes to where all the lessons that we all took as staff, we all had to learn about all of the different animals and sea life that we were working with on just kind of pictures. And it would have been a lot more immersive to have those, um, all those beautiful animals moving and see what they eat, you know, learn in that 3D environment. It would have been a much different learning experience. And I know that's where everything is going. And it's kind of ironic because we had an auditorium there where we did, just like you said, you walk in and you see a 3D experience. We saw the globe and we we're looking at um, environmental uh, concerns around the world and how it affects animals in that auditorium. But we did not have any of that capability in learning for either the staff or to the worldwide audience uh, for that aquarium. So what a big change, you know, in the ability to learn in 3D environments and interactive. I think not just that you can do all those things, but even just remembering all of those things and you, you know, your retention goes way up when you're interacting with content. So um, that's kind of the past to kind of the present and future learning that I see happening. One, one more thing that, that both of you triggered some other thoughts in my mind. And of course, uh, your, your comment, Rena, I mean, shareability, you know, it was so difficult back in the day of 10, 12 years ago when I was trying to do some things, it was so difficult to share. And now, you know, you can build on the fly and share immediately to have that immersive, engaging learning experience with students that supplements other learning. And then the other thing, I don't know, John, for some reason it triggered in your comments, but but I look back in my past prior, prior to joining Eon officially, I put together a textbook for Eon that was 798 pages long on how to use Eon Studio, just 2017, just a few short years ago. And here we are now, we don't need a textbook on how to do all the things that we're talking about. In fact, you know, 30 second video snippets of each little piece or one quick demonstration, and you're ready to build. You don't have to know how to code. You don't have to know how to connect routes. You don't have to understand a whole lot of facets of it. The only thing that maybe is a constant in all this time is that there are 3D digital assets that have been used from the beginning through today. And you know what the good news is? Probably 95% of those digital assets that were created in the past for all the random acts of progress, I call them, are still usable in what we're doing today. They can be converted and used and, and transitioned in, in unique ways. So we have a large library to build upon of past, present, and future content that can be created. So we don't need the big book anymore. I mean, a book can be helpful on concepts and ways and other other things to do. And I've thought about it, but but now it's just so easy to create and build. There's there's no reason for us not to put this in the hands of students and to really give access to to students and faculty to see where this really goes. I think we're ultimately here at that point, and that's that's kind of my final takeaway of of from where I was 2002 range and a little bit before that to now to see what is really, really possible today. And it's exciting, exciting times to be part of this environment and this experience as, as we go forward. Uh, so uh, with that, I think we, we kind of pulled together another one of our podcasts here. John or Rena, if you have any other closing comments you'd like to make, uh, please feel free to, to share those. And you can learn more about us at our upgraded and, and newly updated Eon Reality website. Uh, uh, with more information as we go forward. And we look forward to continuing these conversations in the future. We have a lot of fun talking with each other and, and, and just sharing our experiences and, and our thoughts 
and, and we, like, we like to share those with you. So hopefully you'll join us and follow us and, and look us up on our Discord channel at some point. We can send you a link if you see it and, and get that happening as well. Rena, John, any, any final comments from you? I do have one. Uh, the, bit, the big secret to me in all of this was content. And it reminds me of kind of the growth of something like Netflix is the content is there, but most people don't know about it. I mean, people in our world do, but just the millions of models out there that you can just use. And it's a huge change. It's I, I personally did not was not aware how fast it was growing, but those have been crowdsourced by big companies. And so things like Sketchfab, CD Trader, um, all of a sudden, I, I can't remember them all because I'm on the podcast, but uh, Turbo Squid. <laughs> Turbo Squid and, and others you create, plus CAD yeah. files and lots of conversions. CAD yeah. files, Google, Google Street View is for 360s. I mean, and it's growing every day. And so that there's a wealth of content. So now it's your th like th like Netflix and 3D. Even Netflix, if you go into Oculus and YouTube, have incredible content in 3D. So um, it's available to use without without coding, but just to use in, in whatever you're building. So um, I think that's just a revolutionary change to me. I agree, I agree. Totally. For sure, and I just add to that, you know, we, Gene, when you brought up the, our topic today, I just thought of the word leapfrog. <laughs> okay, we, <laughs> where were we before and where are we now? Yeah. And technology has a funny thing that it sneaks up on you. All of a sudden, you have all these new sites and new ways of, of interacting with, with people and communication, technology, of, really come together in rapid ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just mentioned some of those portals now, and I'm in Sketchfab on a weekly basis, seeing get what, what's new, what's out there. New stuff is being published to that site uh, continually. So I think we're at an exciting point here, uh, but it's nice to look back and realize it's you know, it was, when we look back, we kind of see where we are right now. Um, right. So it's good to just take a peek in that rear view mirror and see where we're headed. But uh, all I know is it's going somewhere fast, but it's an exciting, exciting roadmap to be on. I think fast is the operative word <laughs> yeah. and it's always been fast, but I think now that, it, that uh, we're at this period that it's going to be faster than it's ever been in its evolution. So finally, I, I really do believe that, that the time is here for XR to change the way things are done on, on a big scale. Well, with that, thank you guys once again for another exciting conversation. Again, uh, we, this is an ongoing series of uh, podcasts that we do calling, we're calling those expeditions in the XR Knowledge Metaverse. As we look at all the tools and resources that are available to you, not only through uh, Eon uh, Reality and the Eon XR platform and Eon Merged XR and Spatial Meetings, but also just the overarching look at how XR can change the way teaching and learning occurs. So until next time, we will log off for now, and hopefully you will continue to join us and see some of our future podcasts, and we look forward to hearing from you. Have a great day, everyone, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you next time.